Good morning, church. How's everyone doing this first Sunday of Advent? Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and got to spend time with your family and just enjoyed yourselves. Um, like I said, it's the first Sunday of Advent, which is really exciting because that means the King is coming. Um, Advent literally means anticipation of the arrival of a notable person. And so the most notable person came to us in the form of a baby. And this first week is, is centered around hope. And for me, I love to reflect on how the Lord came so humble and lowly in the form of a baby when so many expected him to come like this warrior king. And of course, we know he is our warrior king, but he came and took on flesh and took on all of our humanity. And I think that's so beautiful because there's literally nothing that we experience in this life that he didn't also experience. Hunger, emotion, fatigue, interaction with other people. I'm sure he had plenty of difficult ones. We know he did. There's no circumstance in this life that we can endure that he didn't also endure. And he's gone even further by experiencing and defeating death. So when we feel misunderstood, when we feel alone, our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is that he came and he's coming again. Our hope is in the fact that he died and rose again. Our hope is in the fact that our father loved us so much that he gave his one and only son so that we could have eternal life. So this morning, our Advent reading is going to be done by the Buckler family. I invite you all to come up. We're just going to center our hearts on the hope of Christ this morning. So reading first from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, 6, and 7. It reads, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah 43 through 5. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. you to stand and worship. Sounding 
joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. We sing joy, come on. Joy, unspeakable joy.
Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this morning and this season of Advent. I just ask that your spirit be in this place, Lord. Quiet our hearts to anything that is distracting. Pray for Kevin as he preaches, Lord, that you would speak through him. Um, thank you that you are our wonderful counselor, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent Jesus. Thank you for this season. We pray for this time that you would bless us, that you would change us, encourage us, teach us. We love you, Jesus. Good morning, Brainerd Baptist. I'm Tara. I hope everybody has had a good Thanksgiving and had your fill of, I'm sure, plenty of good foods. Uh, we're glad to have you here this morning. Just a few announcements. Um, next weekend is a very important weekend in the life of our church. Dr. Curtis Hill will be here preaching, um, or planning to be here, on uh, the weekend of December the 3rd and 4th to preach in view of a call and to provide opportunities to meet with all of you to meet with him. Um, the schedule for the weekend is going to be as follows. Um, on f next Friday, December the 2nd, here in the BX Loft, from 9 to 10.30 a.m., he will be meeting with senior adults. And then from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., um, he'll be meeting with life group leaders. On Saturday, December the 3rd, um, from 9 to 10.30 a.m., it'll be a time with church members at the North Georgia campus. And then from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., he'll have time set aside with church members um, here in the BX gym for our Chattanooga campus. I um, also want to remind you of our 11th annual Keyboards for Christmas that is coming up. Um, this year, you will be able to hear more than a dozen pianists during our Christmas program. Um, this will be in Brainerd Baptist Church Sanctuary down the hill on Saturday, December the 3rd at 2.00. And then on Sunday, December the 4th at 5 p.m. Um, if you have never had the opportunity to come and listen, I want to strongly encourage you. They are amazing, and it's a, a great way to kick off uh, just the holiday season, which has already started. And also, um, next weekend, um, come witness a live nativity scene here on the campus of our uh, um, Chattanooga campus. There will be um, costumed characters, live animals, um, but you will also see and hear the Christmas story through a very unique, dramatic presentation of the birth of Christ. Uh, the nativity scene will be across the street from the main sanctuary. Um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So you can come and enjoy refreshments. There'll be pony rides, uh, face painting, and just an opportunity to make some great memories with your family. Invite friends, neighbors, anyone to come. Um, on Friday night, it will take place from 5.30 to 7.30. Saturday will be after the keyboards at Christmas um, from 3.30 to 5.30. And on Sunday, it will also be after keyboards at Christmas from 6.30 to 8. And we will also be having a Christmas at the Crossing. That will be next Saturday, December the 3rd, from 10 to 4 here in the BX. If you need to do some Christmas shopping, this is a great time to do that. Um, also, fellowship, well, as always. We're Baptists, there's going to be some food, um, but it's also, there will be an opportunities to get Christmas pictures taken with your family. Um, there's going to be craft vendors, boutique vendors, sales vendors, barbecue plates, tasty donuts, um, just the, the season for eating, um, as well as a raffle for some amazing gifts and a professional photographer, as I mentioned, who'll be taking Christmas photos in front of a fun backdrop. But most importantly, 100% of the money raised is going to go to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, so this is a, a wonderful thing just to keep in mind. Um, as we continue to worship here in a few minutes, never forget a form of our worship is in the form of giving. Um, that can take place whether we have blue boxes that are out in the back here. But if you want to write a check or give cash, you can do that. You can always give online at BrainerdBaptist.org under the giving tab. Um, or if you prefer to drop it off in person during uh, staff hours should be in the, down in the main sanctuary. There'll be staff down there this week. And also don't forget our harvest month 
Um, the goal for the month is $450,000. We're getting really close to that. Um, so any other giving you want to do to contribute to that, um, know that it's going towards a great um, our, our church and the ministries that we provide. Um, I will pray, and then I think we'll have our maybe our missions moment, I'm not sure, <laughs> and then Kevin will be coming to preach. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much um, just for another day that you have given us, and thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. I thank you so much for the opportunity to worship. Father, that is something that I know I take for granted, and there are so many places in this world where people cannot f- come together and freely gather and worship and praise your name and I thank you that we have that opportunity please prepare our hearts for the word that you will bring to us um, through Pastor Kevin Um, I thank you so much uh, for all the different things we have going on in our church but most importantly how we always try to point others to you and to your gospel father and all these things I ask in your son's precious name amen in 92, I had the opportunity to go to Russia uh, with Campus Crusade, and we saw God do amazing things. 200 students received Christ in two weeks in Moscow, and since that time, I've also lived in Albania in 2005 for a year. And after that, uh, we've been going back to Eastern Europe uh, about once a year to uh, connect in different countries, uh, primarily uh, Italy, Albania, and Romania. And uh, we have ongoing partnerships that the Lord's given us in these places and so we go back to continue the ministry that God's already doing there to find out how we can serve um, these pastors and ministries and we don't do ministry from the the top down to where we dictate what happens we God has led us to um, like Jesus said you know the greatest will be your servant and so we try to find out what are the needs in the field and how can we meet those needs and also how can we find like unreached people groups that need the gospel in their own language. God has given us a great partnership with the Jesus film. And so um, through another missionary, we got connected to a Macedonian uh, believer who is of the Aromanian people group. They're also called Vlach, Choban, like the yogurt. But Armand Macedon is their official name and they live all over the Balkans and strictly Orthodox background, but probably less than 1.1% of them have a personal relationship with Jesus. And so through the Jesus film and Magdalena, we have been able to use that as a tool to share the gospel and go into these villages that have probably never heard a clear gospel presentation. If you've never seen the Jesus film, they do a great job at the end of the film. It actually goes back and recaps the gospel about Jesus' death for our sins and his resurrection and how we all need to change our mind or repent and believe in the gospel. And so it actually walks people through a prayer if God is leading them, how they can respond. So so that was at the end of the film and then Mito, our friend and and missionary, he got up and in the Macedonian language for about 10 or 15 minutes, he continued to explain the gospel in a language that they understood. And praise God, there were about 12 or 14 people that received Christ that night. And and our prayer for them is that it's just not a a list where you check a box and say, oh, look look at this. These are people that need to be disciples. They need a church. And so Mito is gonna go back in about three weeks and follow up with them and also uh, and eventually uh, we hope to p- help them plant a church in that uh, village for the, these people. From our perspective we need more help to go out into these villages that, um, that have never heard the gospel. In terms of people group outreaches I mean there's so many villages in, in Albania we've never even been able to go to uh, with the Jesus film because we just simply don't have the time or the, the teams So as God works and leads people to go and partner with us, uh, we would love to share uh, with them the vision of what God's doing there so that they can share that vision with with others and it can continue even long after we're all gone. If the Lord tarries, you know, that ministry will continue.
Good morning. It's so good to see how God's using the people in our church to be about His mission that we have here. And I think uh, the star of that video, other than uh, the Lord, is Jeremy. He's hidden back there in the back. And so if you want to grab him and get more of his story on the way out today, uh, you can do that. Uh, I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I... I uh, I have I enjoyed Thanksgiving so much with our family, and uh, and I don't know whether I ate too much turkey or cooked too much turkey, but my mind I've had a hard time kind of hitting the switch and flipping from Thanksgiving to Christmas time, and uh, and so uh, you'll have to forgive me this morning, but my mind has just been on on turkeys the past week, and so uh, I'm sorry for that. You know, turkey has always been at the center of holiday traditions in the United States, especially. Thanksgiving. We believe that the first meal, the Thanksgiving meal that was shared between the Plymouth Pilgrims and the Wapanaug people in 1621 featured wild turkey as the main course. That's why we have turkey on Thanksgiving. Ben Franklin supposedly argued that because wild turkey is native to the United States and because it was so plent- they, they were so plentiful during his time when he was uh, in office that he argued that a turkey should be our national bird rather than the bald eagle. But the importance of turkey at Thanksgiving was probably cemented in a book uh, in our culture by an author named Sarah Josepha Hale. In 1827, she wrote a novel that was entitled Northwood. Probably very few of us have read that novel. It told the story of uh, Thanksgiving and culture in New England. An entire chapter she dedicated to the Thanksgiving meal that happened during that time period in New England. And the entire meal and even that chapter focused on, featured, a roasted turkey sitting at the end of the table. Miss Hale would subsequently campaign to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. She believed that uh, Thanksgiving might help a country divided avoid a civil war. Abraham Lincoln agreed with her. And in 1863, Thanksgiving became a national holiday. Practically, turkeys are a meat that's large enough to feed a large family, financially accessible for the grand majority of people. Its chemistry is central for helping all of us take our Thanksgiving nap. To put it simply, Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving without the turkey. Now, what does all that have to do with our study, our ongoing study through the book of Nehemiah? You may ask, well, What we'll see today is that just like Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving without the bird, God's people aren't God's people without the book. We saw the conclusion last week in chapter 6 of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. As those walls went up in God's city, his witness went out. It was declared who God was because of the walls that went up in the city. And in chapter 7, we heard Nehemiah call the exiles of God's children to live, to return to Jerusalem. Nehemiah organized the people too, and so he set a governor in place, and he restored the roles of the singers and the priests and the Levites, lots of other roles. He he put them all in order. It was time for God's witness to be restored among his people. It was time for his people, God's people, to worship him again. If you'll look in Nehemiah chapter 7, we'll read verses 7, 73 to the first part of 8, 1 together. This is what happened, okay? The priests, Levites, gatekeepers, temple singers, some of the people, temple servants, and all of Israel settled in their towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. Throughout our passage today, we're going to hear a phrase repeated over and over and over. If you like to highlight or mark in your Bible, you may want to mark or highlight this phrase. The phrase that you'll hear over and over again is all the people. It's repeated over and over. Why is it repeated over and over? It's repeated over and over because this, the point of this chapter, the point of what God is about to do really throughout the rest of this book in Nehemiah is all about restoring and rebuilding his people 
so that his witness would go out among them. God's people have returned. They've shown back up. They've arrived in Jerusalem. Now, why did they return? Because the witness of God's return through the rebuilding of those walls has spread. It's spread just through their family lines, through their friends. It has gone out from Jerusalem all the way to the exiles. They're hearing that God is up to something, that He's doing something. The people wanted to be a part of what God's doing. Historians teach us that 50,000 children of Israel, the Israelites, gathered in Jerusalem during the seventh month that we encounter in chapter number 8. The people desired to know God. They wanted to know Him. And so that's why they journeyed back to Jerusalem. They wanted to know Him. They wanted to see what He was doing. They wanted to see the walls go up. They wanted to see uh, what was happening among the people. They wanted to experience it. They wanted to experience what it meant, what it was like to be in a place where God was doing something, where he was showing up and something special was happening. They wanted to be a part of that. And that leads us to what will be the main point of our sermon today. So if you have a piece of paper or something, you write it down, it should be up on your screen. The desire of God's people to know him will lead them to hunger for his word. The desire of God's people to know him. If you want to know the Lord, if you want to know God, a natural thing that will happen is that it will lead us to hunger to know God's word, to know this book that we have, his word that he has given to us. As I mentioned, the table was prepared. If we imagine what was happening in Jerusalem that day as a Thanksgiving feast, we see that all the side dishes are in place, the walls have been rebuilt, the people have returned, the priests, the Levites, the worship team, they're all ready. Everything is set. Now, there are two other side dishes contextually that we have to know about and think about as we look about this at this passage. The first was is that this happened in the seventh month. We could just read past that, but the seventh month was important. The seventh month of the Jewish calendar was filled with important days to remember, days that we'll see as we pass through this time in Nehemiah. The first day of the seventh month was the Feast of Trumpets. It was a day of celebration, a day that we were supposed, all God's people were supposed to rejoice and be joyful. This was supposed to be a day of, of happiness. And then the tenth day was the Day of Atonement. This is when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would throw blood onto the altar and make sacrifice for the sin of all of the people. And then the 15th day was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a holiday where God's people would go and they would live in little shelters that they would build and they would remember how God had delivered and redeemed his people out of Egypt, out of slavery. Now, Whether Nehemiah planned and organized for the walls to be built and the exiles to return on this specific time, in this specific month, whether it was organized or coincidence on Nehemiah's part, the timing seems to be providential, ordained by God that they would be here in this place doing this thing at this time. Now, the second contextual piece, the second side dish that we need to know about is that the people are gathered in the square in front of the water gate rather than in the temple. They normally had these type of meetings, their church services within the temple. But as, 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 as important as the temple was, where the Holy of Holies is, where God would dwell, what God was about to do next was more important than being in a certain place, even a sacred place. What would happen next among his people was much more important than the ritual of going into a building. So what happens next? The table's prepared. All that they're missing is the main dish. And we see the main dish in Nehemiah chapter 1, the second half of verse, that verse, number 1. The people They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given to Israel. Bring the book. Bring the book. You can almost hear them chanting on the tables, bring the book, bring the book. They were hungry for it. They wanted to hear God's word. They wanted to hear what God had to say to them. It was time for the main course, and they were ready 
They were ready to know more about him. They were ready to obey what they would learn about him. The main course was the thing that would satisfy their hunger for God's people to know him. It would be his word. Bring the book, the people cried. Bring it out. Get Ezra to bring it. Now, in this chapter, we'll quickly look at eight characteristics of those people who are hungry for the book. But you need to understand the stage. God has set the table. Everything is ready for him to bring his word to his people. His word would be the mortar that the living stones would make into his wall that his witness would go out from. It's important, though, that as we talk about his word that we understand something very important as we begin. Followers of Jesus, those of us like that claim to be uh, Christians, we're known to be people of the book. But this book that we know and that we love, that we claim to be people of this book, there's nothing magical about it. It's not a good luck charm. We don't get on our knees and pray to this book. We don't, it doesn't do any value putting it on the front, on the front dash of your car. It doesn't keep accidents from happening. There's nothing magical. It is not an idol. What makes this book special, what makes us people of this book, is that our God has revealed himself. He has shown himself to us. He has given us his word through this book. What makes this book important is not the translation, it's not the cover that it has, it's not the pages, it's not any of those things. What makes this book important is that it contains God's word. That every time that we open it, God whispers into our ears, Our desire to know the Lord leads us to hunger for his word. Do you want to know the Lord today? Do you want to follow Jesus today? You can find the answer in his book. Do you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus? You can find it in his book. Do you need help today? Do you need a word from the Lord in the situation that you are in? You can find it in his book today. If you want to know Jesus go to the book. Today we'll look at eight characteristics of those who desire to know the Lord and who hunger for his word. The first one is, is that those who seek God anxiously await God's word. Look at verse number one. The people that you encounter there, the children of God, they're waiting Ezra didn't walk up to the stage while everyone was filling up, tapping off their coffee cups. He didn't walk up to the stage with people arriving late, the ticker running down. He didn't have to coax people into worship. No, they were all there waiting on Ezra. There's not even an account of a worship song to warm them up, to get ready for what was coming next. No, the people were there. And it wasn't Ezra that called the people to worship. It was the people that called Ezra to get the book. Bring the book of the law of Moses, the Bible says. Now, this is the first time that we encounter Ezra. Ezra has appeared, it's the first time he's appeared in Nehemiah, but we've talked about him before. He brought in the second wave of exiles into Jerusalem. Zerubbabel brought in folks, they rebuilt the temple. Ezra came in and he was supposed to preach and teach God's word. And then Nehemiah brought the third wave of exiles back. Now Ezra has been about all this time preaching, teaching, reading, explaining God's word. For 13 years, that's what he's been doing faithfully. As the temple went up, as the walls went up, that's what Ezra was doing. But apparently God's people hadn't received him. If you remember back in chapter 1, what we learned was is that not only had the walls come down, but God's people had fallen down. Their witness was mute because of their unrighteous, the way they walked in light of the word. They weren't giving a witness to their God. 13 years of Ezra faithfully serving as a scribe and a, pe- and, a, and a priest in Jerusalem while the people may not have followed Ezra's teaching. While there may not have been a very large crowd while he preached, even those unrighteous people knew that when it was time to call someone to bring the book, they knew the man who had faithfully read the book the one who faithfully for 13 years had explained the book, they knew who to call. They called the man Ezra. 
It's interesting that the people, when they called for Ezra and they called what for him to teach, they didn't ask for a new word from the Lord. They didn't call for a prophet. No, they called for the law of Moses. They called for a scribe and a teacher. As a reminder, the law of Moses is Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They went back to the basics. Not a new word, but an old word. And if we're honest, maybe with the exception of Exodus, these are not the books that we look forward to in our daily reading plan, right? Nobody says, oh, I can't wait to get to Leviticus today. Leviticus is one of those books that talks about what happens if a spot appears. If it appears on your clothes, if it appears on your pottery, if it shows up on your skin, this is what you do. That's not what we get excited for at six in the morning before we start our day. No, we like to skip past Leviticus, But that's what the people called for. Why did they want to read these books? Because these were the ones that says that the Lord had given to Israel. Here's what they knew about the book of the law. They knew the book of the law had come from the Lord, that the Lord had given it to them. And that's why they longed for it. That's why they hungered for it. Not because of what it said, but because of its author. Because it came from God. And that's who they desired to chase after. The people seemed to understand what Paul would write to Timothy years later. All Scripture is breathed by God. It's profitable for pointing us to righteousness, leading us in that way, and equipping us for what he's called us to do. That's why they wanted the book. The people were anxious, not anxious in a nervous kind of way. They were anxious, expectantly anxious. They were anxious because they knew, like a kid at Christmas, that when Christmas morning comes, I get to open a present. That's what they sat, as how they sat, as they waited for God's word to come to them. Anxious, ready, excited, expectant. But not only that, They were attentive. Those who seek God attentively listen to his word. Look at verses 2 and 3. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, and those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Leviticus 23, verse 24, talks about what was happening this day. It says, tell the Israelites in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you are to have a day of complete rest, a commemoration, and trumpet blast. You're to have a sacred assembly. That's what's happening here. They're fulfilling what the law called them to do, not coincidentally that But on this very day, they're having a sacred assembly. Pay attention to who's at this sacred assembly. The passage says twice, men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. And then it says again, men, women, and all those who could understand. Everyone who could understand was there. Now look how long it lasted. From daybreak until noon. That's a really long sermon, a really long sermon from Leviticus and Numbers. And the people, how did they respond to the really long sermon? Well, they listened attentively. They were hungry for God's Word. They were excited, expectant for God's Word. Now, my goal here isn't to make anyone feel guilty with what I'm about to say. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. But I do think that there are some principles to pay attention to. The first one is, is that all of us should be ready and listening to God's Word when it's open. We should participate in the worship services. And that means that it's appropriate for children who can understand to be in our worship services. The children in Nehemiah's day, they didn't have a special gift of attentiveness, No, they were exactly like the children that we have today. They squirmed, they fought, they wanted to go to the bathroom 10 times during the service, they whined, they wanted to play just like every kid did. That's who they were. But they were at the service, at this holy assembly, because they could understand. At Brainerd, we encourage you to bring your kids to service as soon as they can understand. We assume that that time's long about kindergarten. We ask that you bring them into our services with us. Now, we, don't, we are not under any illusion 
that a kindergartner will not squirm during the service. We are not under any illusion that they won't get up and have to go to the bathroom, that they will get, grasp every detail of what is said. We know what a, how kindergartners act when they're in a worship service, but we still want them to be here. We believe that with every service that they attend, that they'll learn and they'll understand more, that they'll grow more and more of a taste of what God's Word is, and as they're here longer and longer, that that taste will become a hunger. Here's some counsel for you. If you're a parent with young kids, just take this. We've been there. Laura and I have been there. If you want your kid to be excited about the worship service, here's some counsel. Be excited about the worship service. If you want your kid to open their Bible up during the service, open your Bible up. If you want your kid to pay attention during the worship service, pay attention during the worship service. The same is true for taking notes, any number of other things that you might want to happen for your kid during a worship service. We model for our kiddos what it looks like to hunger for God's Word as they sit beside us in these services. They won't always get it, but sitting with their parents and others in the service shows them, gives them a taste of what they should be hungering for. Now, there are lots of us who sit here and we don't have young kids. If that's you today and you're thinking, whew, so glad he's not talking to me anymore. Glad I'm past that. Well, bad news. You're still a model. You know what happens when a five or six-year-old sits in a worship service and they look around and they don't want to be still and they don't want to pay attention, but they look and they look at all of the adults in the room, they look at the students in the room, and they see them all with their Bibles open? Do you know what happens? The Bibles are open and they notice that the people's faces, they're all paying attention, they're all engaged with what's going on. Do you know what happens with the five or six-year-old? They think they're missing out on something and they start to do what everybody else is doing. I don't know what that guy's doing, but everybody's paying attention, so maybe I should pay attention too. All of us have a role in teaching our kids to hunger for the Lord. And the second thing, for those of us who our kids should already be past this stage, we need to have grace on kiddos and their parents when the kids don't do exactly what they should do. Just because a kid makes a little noise doesn't mean we need to cut them a bad look. It means we need to pray for mom and dad and the kid that they'll begin to hunger for the Lord. The kids in Jerusalem on this day, they sat attentively from daybreak until noon. Now, some of you think that we preach that long, but we don't. I promise. It does not go from daybreak until noon. It's not that long. We won't ask your kids to do that. Here's another important piece to catch. As we've already mentioned, as Ezra opens this book up, he's reading from the book of the law. He's not dumbing it down. He's not giving his summary of it, what he thinks it means. He's not telling stories. He's not reading anything else, commentaries on it. He is reading God's Word. Because we believe that God's Word is breathed from God, it's useful for, 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 for perfecting us and for pushing us and showing us God's voice and teaching us. That's why at Brainerd we, we teach and we preach expositional sermons. Because we, want to, we believe that we take a passage of Scripture, we lay it open, we expose it, we explain what it means so that you don't hear from the voice of the pastor in the pulpit, but that you hear God's voice, that you know what, to, what it means and what to do with it. That's why we preach this way. As God's people, we should be anxious for God's Word. We should be attentive to God's Word. And the reason is that we esteem God's Word. Look at verses 4 and 5. Those who seek God esteem His Word. The scribe Ezra, listen to what he did, stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose. Matithia, Shema, Anania, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masaiah stood beside him on his right. And to his left stood Pedaiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hash banana, I don't know how to say that. It sounds like banana every time I say it. Zechariah, Meshulam. Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people since he was elevated above everyone. As he opened it, the people stood up. The people stood up. They esteemed God's word. You see, the word is central. Approximately 50,000 people waiting to hear God's Word. 
It's elevated, not because Ezra is elevated, but because his word is elevated. It's elevated so that people could hear him, but also so that they could see what he's doing. It's unknown whether these men that with Ezra up here, whether they took turns or whether they were just there to give affirmation about the importance of what's taking place. It's not immediately clear how 50,000 people heard Ezra without a sound system. I don't have an answer to that. I've tried to come up with means, and I don't have any means. And so, But here's what we do know is that not only does the Bible say this happened, but history says it happened, that these people listen to God's Word. They stood and they listened because they were hungry. Standing on an elevated pulpit, Ezra opens up the book, or rather he rolled out the scroll in full view of the people because it was important to the, for Ezra and for these people to know that these were not Ezra's words, but these were God's words. There's a reason, other than my forgetfulness, that I bring the Bible up every week at benediction. It's so that you don't think that I'm speaking my words over you as we go out, but so that you know that we're speaking God's words over you. The people esteemed God's word to such a degree that when that scroll rolled open, everyone rose to their feet. Why was that? Because the word from God was in their presence. They understood that what they heard was they were hearing God's voice, a gift that he had given them. The reason they stood is the same reason that if any of you walk into my house that I stand up from my seat and I go to the door and I greet you. I do it out of respect and esteem for you. You're a guest in my house. You're in my presence. The people stood because God had entered into their presence. They were esteeming him. They were giving him respect. Those who seek God anxiously await His Word, attentively listen to His Word, and esteem His Word. And they also affirm His Word when they hear it. Those who seek God affirm His Word. Look at verse number 6. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And with their hands uplifted, all of the people said, Amen, Amen. And they knelt low and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The reading of God's Word led Ezra to bless the Lord, to bless the Lord. His response to, was to God, and God's people had heard the Word, who had heard the Word, agreed with Him. They agreed in at least three ways. They lifted up their hands because they were in God's presence. They lifted up their voices saying, amen, amen. They worshiped with their faces on the ground. The affirmation of God's word that we read here is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. You've not sinned if you've never raised your hands in a worship service. You've not sinned if you don't bellow out amen at everything I say, though I do encourage it. You've not sinned if you've never come and bowed on your knees in public before the church. None of those things are sins. This is not a prescriptive passage, but it is a descriptive passage. I wonder if unraised hands, closed mouths, and empty invitation and invitation times should be normative for someone, for some people, for some church who desires God and hungers for His Word. Does the church that truly desires Him the church that truly hungers for him, are they characterized by people who never raise their hand, people who never say amen, people who never come to the front to pray? Is that what they look like? I wonder what the effect of those responses are to others, those hands in our pockets, those shut mouths, those knees that don't bend. What's the effect for those young ones who are old enough to understand what do they learn when, the, when our normal responses are these rather than the response of the people in Jerusalem when Ezra opened up his book? How does it teach them that we are to worship? What does it say about the, what we believe about our Lord? It's interesting that worship follows the reading of God's Word. That rather than standing during worship and sitting during the reading of God's Word, the exact opposite thing happened. With their response, the people affirmed 
God's word. Everything they did affirmed the importance of God's word, that they believed in it, that they were going to be willing to follow it, submit themselves to it. Those who seek God anxiously await his word. Those who seek God attentively listen to his word. They esteem his word. They affirm his word because they desire to understand his word. Those who seek God desire to understand his word. Look at verses 7 through 8, another list of names that are hard to to, uh, pronounce. Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Pelaiah, who were Levites, explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. The priest here, as God's word is read, they explain the law to the people. Verse number 8 says that they translated what the, what the word was. That, this word translated probably carries two meanings. The first meaning is we have to remember that the people that are gathered, this 50,000 people, some of them had lived their entire lives as exiles. Their primary language was Aramaic. And so when they came into Jerusalem and they heard God's word in Hebrew, there were words that they missed that they didn't understand. So in the first sense, they actually did translate probably. But in another sense, translate can also mean that they broke down the text. The follow-up phrase in verse number 8 says that they gave meaning to it. They made it clear. This would have been what we refer to and what we've already talked about. What we try to do here is when we exposit the text, explaining and applying what the passage says. The people were hungry for this. They had stood from daybreak to noon, and now they stood longer trying to understand more about what God's Word said. They wanted to know God, and so they hungered for His Word. The people were hungry for this. They wanted to understand what God's Word said, and so they stayed and they listened. But understanding God's Word also has another effect. When we really truly understand, when we really hear God's Word, oftentimes it brings us under conviction about what God's Word says to us and who we are. That seems to be what happened here when we look at verses 9 through 11. Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. He said, do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. They recognized who they were and how who they were didn't match what the law said. Then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, Send portions to those who have nothing prepared since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink and send portions that have, and have great celebration because they understood the words that were explained to them. Conviction had brought mourning and weeping. (coughs) Mourning and weeping. While the natural response to understanding God's word was conviction, the most appropriate and immediate response for the people should have been joy. This wasn't to be a day of mourning and weeping, this was to be a day of joy and celebration. First, not to have joy was to break the law. What was supposed to happen on the first day of the seventh month was the day of trumpets. And so the people were mandated, ordered, commanded to be happy. That's a great command. The Lord commands you to be happy. That's what they were commanded on that day. And if they were mourning, they weren't doing what God's Word said. This was to be a holy convocation, a holy assembly. And the second reason they weren't supposed to be sad or mourning or weeping was that the people may what the people may not have understood is that the God that they were hearing about, the God whose word they were listening to, was a God who finds joy in redeeming his witness. He did that. They had already seen it as the walls went up. He enjoyed providing for those walls to go up so that people would know of his glory. But now he is even finding greater joy in the hearts of his people being restored and redeemed. 
Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. That's what the psalmist writes. You see, the God whose word they heard was a God who finds joy in repentance and obedience. We find joy today in knowing of God's character in knowing that He will forgive us, and knowing about how we can obey Him. His law is not hidden from us. We know how to be in right relationship with Him. His ways are not hidden. He has revealed them to us in His Word. We can know God through His Word. Think about that. We can be in relationship with the one true God because of His Word being revealed to us, revealing to us how we can follow after Him, that if we confess our sins, repent of them, and follow Him, that we can know Him, and He provides all that we need to do what He wants us to do through His Word. That should bring us great joy. That's something to celebrate. Understanding God's Word leads us to joy. Those who seek God anxiously await His Word, attentively listen to His Word, esteem His Word, affirm His Word, desire to understand His Word, find joy in His Word, and that joy will lead them to spread His Word to others. Those who seek God spread His Word. Look at verses 13 through 15. On the second day, the family heads of all the people, along with the priests and the Levites, assembled before the scribe Ezra, to study the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should dwell in shelters during the festival of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and spread this news throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hill country and bring back branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make shelters just as it is written. Ultimately, you see, Teaching all the people to understand God's Word wouldn't be dependent on Ezra standing in a pulpit with the priest by his side. Ultimately, on day number two, instead of all the people gathering, it was the heads of each family that gathered. And the reason that they gathered was that they could be empowered and equipped to teach those in their families. That each father, each mother would have a responsibility to share with their kids that it would be a trickle down of understanding of God's word. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse, verses 6 and 7, a verse that, verses that many of you guys know by heart says this. It says, these words I have given to you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your head. Let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. God's Word, giving understanding to those that He has entrusted with us, should be a lifestyle that we have. A desire to understand and to share, to spread, to disciple others with His Word. You see, the Word of God will indelibly mark a family that desires to know Him. God's Word begins to be infused into all the decisions that they make as a family. Every aspect of their lives changed by God's Word. We read here that the people were reminded of the requirement to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacle. We mentioned that earlier, where the people would live in these temporary shelters for a few days and be reminded of the redemption from slavery and from Egypt that they had experienced. And so what did the heads of the families do? They spread the word of God that they had just heard, and they called on others to obey God with them. To hear and to understand God's word comes with the responsibility of sharing and understanding with others. Each of us bears that responsibility. The pastor in the pulpit, the life group leader, the deacon, the father, the grandfather, the young mom, all of us have the responsibility of sharing our understanding of God with others. And when those who seek God receive His Word as it's spread, they obey His Word. Those who seek God obey His Word. Look at verses 16 through 18. The people went out and they brought back branches And they made shelters for themselves on each of their rooftops and courtyards. The court of the house of God, the square by the water gate and the square by the Ephraim gate. 
The whole community that had returned from exile made shelters and lived in them. The Israelites had not celebrated like this from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day. And there was tremendous joy. Ezra read out of the book of law of God every day from the first day to the last. The Israelites celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. Those who seek God obey his word. I want you to put yourself in their shoes. The people had just rebuilt the city wall. They've all come back and they've begun to rebuild their new homes. Many of them have rebuilt brand new homes. They're celebrating what God has done among them, how he's restored his witness among the city. Don't you think that they want to take a sabbatical from this festival where they have to leave their nice, new, finished houses and go put a little temporary shelter on top of their rooftop or out in their, out in their patio? Don't you think they would want to ask the Lord for a pass on that? Lord, you've just done this mighty work. Look at my brand new house, and you want me to get leaves and branches and build a little lean-to on my roof? Like, can we pass on that this year? But these people, they had seen God work. They desired to understand him and to obey him. And so when God's word said, go build a lean-to, a temporary shelter, what did they do? They went and they got leafy branches and they built a lean-to, a temporary shelter. And they put it on the new roofs of their house. They put it out in their courtyards. They obeyed the Lord. And the strangest thing happened when they obeyed the Lord. Obedience led to tremendous joy. Doing what God had told them to do, doing, even though it seemed silly, it brought them tremendous joy because they were doing what God had told them. They were experiencing God. They were hearing the stories again and again as they sat in those temporary shelters about how God had redeemed them, rescued them, how he had had grace on them, how he loved them. Even despite who they were, he saved them from slavery in Egypt. They wanted to learn more. They wanted to obey more because they wanted more and more joy. With everything they understood, every time they obeyed, the joy increased. The desire of God's people to know him leads them to hunger for his word. And the more that we learn, the more that we want, knowing God and obeying his commands leads us to have an insatiable desire to grow and to understand more and more, to obey him more and more because we want more and more joy. Allow me to conclude today with several rapid fire questions of application. Question number one, do we anxiously await God's word? Does that characterize us? Are we a people who anxiously await God's word? Are we looking for opportunities to hear God's word explained to us? Does anxiously awaiting for God's word, God's word does that describe our ride to church this morning? Do we come to church early so that we can hear his word, so that we don't miss anything? Do we expect every time that we or a life group leader or the pastor opens up God's word is our expectation that God is going to speak, that we will hear his voice? Do we anxiously await God's word? Is that our expectation? Do we attentively listen to God's word? Do your quiet times and times in worship, when you think about those times, are those times, are, are, are they distinguished or characterized as Times of focus or times of distraction? Do we attentively listen to God's Word? Do we esteem God's Word? Do we esteem God's Word? What does that look like in your life personally? How do you esteem God's Word? What priority does God's Word have in your life? Is it primary? Does God's Word, is it esteemed so much that that's the first place you go as you're trying to make a decision on what you're supposed to do with your life, how you're supposed to spend your money, how you're supposed to raise your kid. Is God's word esteemed in your life? Do we affirm God's word? What keeps us from responding in worship? What keeps us from raising our hand or saying amen or bowing our knee? Is it a sinful issue in our heart? Or is it something else? What keeps us from affirming God's word? What's the consequence of not affirming God's word in this way? 
Do we desire to understand His Word? Do we wake up every day and get into our daily Bible reading? Do we participate in a life group? Do we look for Bible studies to be a part of? Do we desire to understand more and more God's Word? Do we find joy in God's Word? Do you enjoy reading God's Word? Do you enjoy coming to church? Do you enjoy your life group? Not just because the people are nice, but do you enjoy it because this is great. We get to hear God's voice on a daily basis. We get to sing to Him every week. We get to hear His Word explained to us weekly. Does it give you joy and excitement to be in His house, among His people, with His Word? Do we spread His Word? Have you shared God's Word with others? Those that don't know Jesus, those that do know Jesus but need to learn how to hunger for His Word more, when's the last time that you shared God's Word with someone else? Do we obey His Word? Are we allowing God's Word to guide our lives? Is what God says, is that what we do? Are we committed followers of Jesus in such a way that when God's Word says it, we do it? The desire of God's people to know Him, our desire to know Him. If you truly desire to know the Lord today, then you need to hunger for His Word. Hunger for it. You need to want it. You need to desire it. When you wake up in the morning, you need to want it like you want breakfast. Those who seek God anxiously await His Word. Attentively listen to his word, esteem his word, affirm his word, desire to understand his word, find joy in his word, spread his word, and obey his word. Are you seeking God in his word today? Let's pray together. Lord, I ask you that you would put in our hearts a hunger, Lord, for your word. Not because your word is special in in and of itself, Lord, but because your word is from you, that you've given it to us. And it is a pathway, Lord, to knowing you and being in relationship with you. God, I pray, Lord, that if there are those here that don't know you, that they would go to your word. And I pray, Lord, that if there are those here who've strayed away from you, Lord, that they would go to your word. I pray, Lord, that we would truly characterize being a people of your word, Lord, because we want to be your people. Father, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. As you came in today, you should have picked up uh, one of these uh, communion cups. If you're a baptized believer, a follower of Jesus, we would invite you to join us uh, during this time. As we uh, practice the Lord's Supper, it's a time of remembrance. It's a time that we remember what Jesus has done for us. But we don't know what Jesus has done for us without his word. And so as we remember him, we go to his word. We hear about his sacrifice for our sins. We hear about a graceful gift that he will forgive us despite who we are. All those through his word. Paul didn't want the church in Corinth to miss that. So he wrote to the church, And he said, for I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Also, Jesus took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He said, For as often as you eat this bread, as often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's sing our praises to the Lord today. As we respond, I invite you to stand if you'd like. Stay seated if you'd like. This is a time of response. Reflect. Such a joy to be in his presence. 
to receive his word. My heart is full. Let's respond.
so good to worship together. It's so good to hear God's word. Amen. Amen. See what I did there? I tricked you into doing it. <laughs> Next week, as we come to worship, I want to remind you of a couple things. Next week, we're only having one BX service, okay? That happens at 9 o'clock. And so for all of you guys in here, if you want to worship in the BX next week, we're going to have lots more chairs in here, figure out how to fit everybody in. Dr. Curtis Hill is coming to preach in view of a call. That's the Baptist way to say you get to meet your future senior pastor. And so you want to be here, ask a friend to come join you. Allow that to be a time. Allow Come and worship the Lord next week. Listen to your pastor preach from his word. So be here at 9 o'clock. We'll vote at the end of that 9 o'clock time. Okay, if you're a member of our church, you'll vote during that time. If you sleep in, you'll need to go down the hill to the sanctuary where you'll also hear Dr. Curtis Hill preach the same sermon. You don't need to hear him twice. There's not space for everybody to hear him twice. Go down there. You'll vote at the end of that service. At the end of the time, both of those will also be simulcast to North Georgia. Everybody will vote in every service. At the end of the time, we will affirm him to be our senior pastor. And so come next week, come expectant, come ready to celebrate uh, what the Lord's doing in our church family. I want to close the same way we always close, praying that God would be gracious to us and bless us, that he would make his face to shine upon us that, so that his way would be made known on earth, his salvation among all the nations. Go in the peace and love of Jesus Christ. We can't wait to see you again next week.